Welcome to The Third Story. I'm Leo Sidrin. Every January for the past 16 years, the Winter Jazz Fest has set up shop in New York. Generally, it happens around the APAP Conference, the Association of, Association of Performing Arts, and more recently around the Jazz Congress Conference as well. So the city fills up with people from all over the globe who come to New York to schmooze, to listen, and to connect. Some music festivals are contained both in time and in space, and are destinations in themselves. A few years ago, I interviewed George Ween, who's known as the godfather of the modern music festival, about how he developed his concept for the Newport Jazz and Folk Festivals. And you can hear my conversation with him, as well as my coverage of the Newport Jazz Festival in the archive at third-story.com. More on that in a minute. Anyway, there's the kind of jazz festival that takes place on site during a fixed amount of time, like the Newport festivals. And then there's the kind of festival that's more like a concert series or cycle, like in many European cities they have that kind of thing during the month of November, let's say, where over the course of four weeks there's one concert each week or each night for the length of their festival. But then there's the kind of thing like the Winter Jazz Fest, in which a series of venues that are close enough to walk between, but spread out enough that they happen in the space of normal life so that the festival and the rest of the community are interacting with one another, is set up. Not all jazz in New York this week was happening in the context of a festival. Spike Wilner, another former guest of this podcast and the owner of two important jazz clubs in the West Village, Smalls and Mesro, wrote on Facebook over the weekend, Quote, Smalls Jazz Club and Mesro continue their winter, summer, spring, autumn jazz fests tonight and every night, seven nights per week. No funding, no corporate sponsors, no hype, just the same great music night after night after night. So it's a larger conversation. What is the value of a festival? How does it interact with the regular ongoing scene in a city? And I'm not here to have that conversation with you today, although it is present in the background uh, of this episode anyway. So about a week ago, I was sitting at home when my jazz pal, publicist Matt Marowitz, texted me around 11 p.m. and asked if I would be available to go down to the Moxie Hotel in the East Village and do some interviews over the weekend in a space called the Sound Lounge that had been set up by the Bowers and Wilkins Audio Company and Relics Magazine. The interviews were live streamed on Relics and Winter Jazz Fest social platforms, but I am repackaging them here uh, for the next couple of weeks in a series of episodes for the podcast. I had to snap into action and book some guests for these events. I reached out to a series of friends and people who were involved in the conference in some way or another. And one of my first calls was to trumpeter, slide trumpeter, arranger, composer, and band leader Stephen Bernstein, who I actually had never met, but I had been wanting to meet for a long time. Stephen has been on the scene in New York for 40 years. He's known for his work with the Lounge Lizards and his band's Sex Mob and Stephen Bernstein's Millennial Territory Orchestra. That's the project that he performed with at the Winter Jazz Fest this year. But he has also put in plenty of time playing rock and roll, scoring for film and television, and helping both literally and figuratively to orchestrate a scene in New York, sometimes known as the downtown scene, that brings together disparate musical tendencies and elements into one space inside and outside at the same time. Music that is both challenging and provocative and also makes your butt shake. Much of that music is associated with the Knitting Factory, the venue and label that was home to that scene for many years. And you can hear my conversation with Michael Dorff, the guy who started the Knitting Factory in the Third Story Archive too. Stephen Bernstein is so associated with New York that it's easy to overlook the fact that he came out of Berkeley, California. I mean, in fairness, he left as soon as he could and he came to New York, but he was part of a generation of musicians to come out of the East Bay at the end of the 1970s, to come out of one high school, in fact, Berkeley High, and make a mark on the music. Over the years, lots of players came out of Berkeley High, going all the way back to Johnny Otis way back in the day, but including Lenny Pickett, Joshua Redman, and Ambrose Akimusery. But in the late 1970s, There was this crew of dudes, Stephen Bernstein among them, who were developing a language that combined free improvisation and funk and tried to expand the edges of the music. Two of his high school pals, even grade school pals, who have gone on to make their contribution in New York and far beyond are multi-instrumentalist Peter Applebaum and guitarist Will Bernard. Peter and Will were performing at the festival with their project, Revelator, a band they have with bassist and producer Bill Laswell and drummer Aaron Johnston. So I invited them down to hang out too. 
I'm calling today's episode with Stephen Bernstein, Peter Applebaum, and Will Bernard, the Berkeley Boys. We'll start with my conversation with Stephen, and you'll hear me invite Will and Peter to join us halfway through. Third-Story.com is the place to check out the archive, including interviews with fellow Berkeley brother Charlie Hunter and guitarist Adam Levy, who also spent time in the San Francisco scene. Also, the aforementioned interviews with Spike Wilner, George Ween, and Michael Dorff, and more. At the website, third-story.com, you can check out the Spotify playlist I curated for this episode. There are some videos and the links to my socials to patronize us on Patreon and to subscribe. Here's my conversation with the Berkeley Boys, starting with the highly engaging Stephen Bernstein. All right. I get to meet Leo. Yeah. Man, I moved to New York 15, 16 years ago, and I feel like from the second I arrived, uh, I knew that I was going to have to get in a room with you. It took me a a minute here. It took you a while, man. I don't know where where you've been. (laughs) But you moved here like 40 years ago. Yeah. And in fact, it's really crazy. Because I keep saying I don't want to talk about the past, yeah. I want to talk about the future, but I just parked my car down in front of a club that was called 8BC. Now, 8BC, back, so I started, I moved here in September 79, and I immediately started hanging out. The very, one of the very first places I went to was La Mama, not La Mama Theater, but La Mama, which was Charles Bobo Shaw's place that okay. he ran, which was on... Now I can't even... T- I think it was fifth between B and C. Yeah. So I immediately came down to the East Village because this was before there was a word downtown. It was just the East Village. and you came It was down- no downtown scene at that point. No, there was the East Village. And yeah. that meant anything from Allen Ginsberg and Don Cherry and Bobo and Butch Morris and Threadgill. Air had their own studio mm-hmm. over on, uh, I think, actually 12th Street, right around the corner here. Or... You're talking about Richard Hell and Blondie and you know, the Misfits and, you know, uh, well, Talking Heads, they were over in Long Island City. But, uh-huh. you know, that whole world, it was all, and then Jim Jarmusch yeah. and the Lounge Lizards and Zorn and Wayne Horvitz and Bobby Previtt. And the idea was if you just walked around the streets here, you'd meet all these people. Yeah. Now, I don't walk around these streets anymore. In fact, I'm looking around. I'm saying there's no one I know. And then I run into one of my daughter's friends. Well, of <laughs> so, course. That's so how that, long you've been here. That's how long I've been here. It's like, oh, but yeah, my daughter's friends live here now. Right. When you got here, there was no knitting factor. There was none of that scene. You were playing at the Danceteria. Oh, yeah. And Mud Club. Yeah. And A7. You know, I had the most amazing talk with Nicholas Payton last night, yeah. who I just think is just the highest level of everything. And you, we all know Nicholas's whole thing. He's, a pro, he's really a proselytizer for BAM. And I was talking about how he's probably the only person who who has the, the gravitas to say this, and you can't really argue with him because of who he is. And I said, well, Nicholas, you know, I can't say that, though, because of who I am. But I came, you know, I didn't even identify as a jazz musician, even though I love jazz and play, been playing my whole life. And it wasn't until, like, I realized, oh, shoot, I'm headlining jazz festivals. Oh, I'm winning downbeat awards. I, I guess maybe I'm a jazz musician. So why didn't you identify? Like, on the other hand, I, I know that you love Duke Ellington, that you didn't have a lot of non-jazz music in no, your I life. No, I didn't listen to any. I mean, yeah, I did. I mean, P-Funk. Yeah. And, and blues. Yeah. But yeah, I basically listened to Duke Ellington. And, and the art ensemble, and I mean, that my world was the art ensemble, Cecil, Don Cherry. Yeah. That was my world. As far as, that was the young people playing music. Yeah. I mean, they were the... the People who played, and Julius Hemphill, and, and you know, all those musicians. That's, to me, they were the most cutting edge, so I really liked them. But when Nicholas said, he said, you got, before I did, saying, but I, I wasn't dealing with, like, not using the word jazz. I was just like, yeah, jazz is cool, but I'm like a, a, a Jewish guy from Berkeley who, like, loves all kind of music, so why can't it, why can't it just be music for me? Like, why can't I just play music? And, and that's why I was attracted to the East Village, because it was just like this gumbo of, of influences that was ranging from, oh, there's Allen Ginsberg, there's Don Cherry, there's, there's Richard Hell, blah, blah, blah. There's Lu- or it's really culture. I mean, because what you're describing is not all music. Some of it is actually just culture. Right, but it never was all music. Right. It was always culture. Like, my trumpet teacher in New York was Jimmy Maxwell. Yeah. Jimmy Maxwell replaced Harry James in Benny Goodman's band in 1940. And sat next to Cootie Williams and was there for the first day Charlie Christian joined the band. He was there to hear Coleman Hawkins, 
when Coleman Hawkins came back from Europe. He was there to hear Dizzy Gillespie go from sounding like Roy Eldridge to sounding like <laughs> Dizzy Gillespie. And what he used to tell me about Benny Goodman, you know, when people think about Benny Goodman, they think, oh, this kind of like, oh, it's swing music. It's very staid. It's very, you put on a suit and it's very, no, man, as Jimmy explained to me and, and I put it into my mind, it's like, no, they were like Nirvana. Yeah. They were like the loud, drunk white dudes. That's who Benny Goodman band was. They were the loud, drunk. They were probably the loudest band. Yeah. Like, I don't think there was a louder band than Benny Goodman. Yeah. That's people don't rock. That. We, th we think about that now as being this kind of sweet, traditional. No, uh, man, that was punk rock. Yeah. Benny Goodman was punk rock. Louis Armstrong was punk rock. Right. I mean, they were all just shattering down the walls. Right. In that sense, I understand why you wanted to shed the title. But on the other hand, it, jazz could be anything. J jazz can be that, too. Yeah. And it just felt like, at the time, maybe not that welcoming to someone who... But I, I just felt like, yeah, I don't know why. I just felt like I, I, didn't, I didn't need it. I, I just felt like I can be me. Yeah. And, and the thing is, if you play the trumpet, and you love Louis Armstrong, and you love Duke Ellington... Well, they're going to call you jazz anyway. You can call yourself whatever you want. They're going to... I can call myself whatever I want. And I said, I just want to be a musician. And that's all that interested me. But also, like... And this has really happened now that I'm an el elder. Yeah. Is that I have no hierarchy anymore. Meaning like, what? Meaning, like... Because from playing with Levon, and then... And I yeah. talk about in this article about with Larry Campbell, when I got hip to the fact that there's certain chords that just need to be a root and a fifth... Yeah. And that is actually what that chord is. And that's some beautiful, deep music. And I realized, you know, some people would be like, oh, yeah, well, that's just some really, like, simple root and a fifth. And, and this chord has all these notes in it. Yeah, but uh, that's just a different song. One's not better. It's like one's one song and one's another song. And if, if you played that chord you're talking about in this song, you'd just be playing the wrong chord. So there's no hierarchy. It's just like there's different kind of music. And each music has its own set of tropes that make it work. And the more, for me, it's like, why wouldn't you want to play all that music? Like, why wouldn't I want to play? I got to play with salsa music with Hector Laveau. Yeah. I got to play, you know, heavy rock music with Lou Reed. I got to play Haitian music with Skasha. I got to play rock and roll with, with yeah. Lee Him. Why would you not? But then I play Duke Ellington's music s sitting next to Jerome Richardson and Britt Woodman. Yeah. Why would you not want to be able to do that? Man, I did free improvisation with Sam Rivers and Prince Lachey and Eddie Gale. Like, why would you not want to have to play all, like, just absorb all this beautiful music that's in the world? Well, I think that's what's interesting is that it seems to me that if you, you came here with Sam Rivers and Duke in your head, like, those were the sort of the two It's things. so funny you said that. That's exactly what I was hearing. Yeah. That's it. And I, I said, man... You know, I like I love our Blake and the Jazz Messengers, but that's actually not what I want to play. I yeah. want to play the way Freddie Hubbard played on that Sam Rivers yeah. record. Like that's what I want. I want to figure out well, how do I do that? That's what was pulling my ear. Like what I think is so interesting is when you say I just want to be me. I, it's a legitimate question. You started a lot of your projects when you started to assert yourself as a leader, and you put your name in the project. Yeah. Stephen Bernstein's Millennial ter yeah. Territory. Yeah. Stephen Bernstein's Sex Mob. Well, now they just say that because because it was it's it is sex. It mob. is sex mob, right? But but the thing is, when you want to get booked at Jazz Lincoln Center, if you want to get booked at yeah. SF Jazz, the name Sex Mob is still too scary. If I was smart, I would have used a name like Bad Plus. But you know, <laughs> what's the scary word? Sex or mob? Sex. It's the, is sex. Sex. sex scares you can't people. put sex in the. Not with jazz. That's see, that's the thing about jazz. I mean, you could have the Sex Pistols. Sure. No, no one's gonna think twice about that. But to have a jazz band, which is where we can't use. It Why did is, you call it Sex Mob? It, I didn't know the band would be together 24 years. I thought it was just something I was having fun with. Here's what happened. I'm hanging out with Michael Dorf. Yeah. And Michael and I, he's a guy who runs a knitting, ran sure. the knitting factory. And we were old friends. Our yep. sisters were, were lovers. Yeah. So like before we even met each other, like we were Check it out. brother in laws. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, um, and my, our sisters even bought a house together. They're not together anymore. They have their own families. But um, so we're hanging out. He says, man, I'm starting this new thing. I, uh, I'm doing these midnight. I'm calling it late night hang. It's 11 yeah. to 2. I'm, I just 100 bucks cash, but you can drink beer and you can just play music. And I said, well, man, I've been trying to like 
developed the slide trumpet. And I'm putting together a little group where I play the slide trumpet. And I think so, I'd be perfect because it's like having a paid rehearsal, right? And back yeah. then, like, I couldn't even make it through a second set on the slide trumpet. I'd be like spitting, spitting dust on the second set. Hmm. So he said, well, what do, you call it? what do you call a project? I said, well, I don't really have a name. How about uh, Stephen Bernstein's uh, like slide trumpet quartet? He said, well, that sounds like four slide trumpets. I said, oh, yeah. I said, well, how about slide? And then, of course, we're just riffing. I said, how about slide mob? He said, oh, that's cool. I said, I like the name. And then, of course, I, my brain, yeah. I go, well, what about sex mob? And he goes, yeah, that's really cool. And I said, you'd print that in the paper? Because back then, you'd, you'd buy an ad in the Village Voice. Yeah. And he said, yeah. I said, okay, cool. And that, that was it. That's and did you, did you feel more people came or less people came? Because it was a free gig. No yeah. one, no one, did, but, but no, it's like, it's having a curse. It's a curse and a blessing because nobody forgets the name sex mob. That's right. And you know, people are like, oh, sex mob, you know? And on the other hand, some of you are like, you're this, there's, first of all, there's like the fact that like certain places are a little trepidatious about booking a band called Sex Mob. Yeah. And second of all, like, you know, here I'm 57 year old like guy and someone introduced me to someone they've never, like a, a woman they don't, I've never met before in the music business. They go, yeah. oh, he's the king. He's Mr. Sex Mob. And I'm like, uh, it's like, uh. Times change, but the, the name follows. You know, in retrospect, it's in- interesting that you didn't choose to call it Slide and the Family Stone since you got deep into playing Sly music later yeah. on. The thing is, Sly was what I grew up on. Yeah. So my next door neighbor, he was a black, he was a Black Panther, and uh, did all the photographs of Black Panther. And there was always Sly and Family Stone coming out of the house. And I was second and third grade, so I didn't really know it was Sly and the Family Stone. It was just this music that I heard constantly. And then when I got older, and I bought a Sly and the Family Stone record at like a, a yard sale, I put it on and went. Whoa, that's that music I used to hear in second and third grade. And it's like most things were like all the hairs on your arms like raise up and you start crying. And it's just like, oh my God, it's this like incredible feeling of like this music I haven't heard in so long. And that kind of reignited like this love of like this early DNA. Yeah. What was it like when you started making Jewish music? So Zorn, whatever it was, 18 years ago, says to me, Hey man, you know you should make a record for Zadik. Yeah, and I was like, thanks, John, because I love John. I've known him since I was like 18, 19 years old. But I didn't tell him like, man, I've never put a record out under my own name. My last name's Bernstein, which is already weird enough being a jazz musician. It feels like that was something that you carried with you when you moved here. I'm a white Jewish guy from Berkeley. I'm a Jewish jazz musician. That's something that you felt on yeah, you. Yeah, but I didn't want to identify like I'm the guy that plays Jewish music. Yeah. I'm like, I'm just like, a guy who happens to be Jewish. It's yeah. like, I don't, so I kind of didn't want to do it. Because I never, I didn't want like the f- my first thing with my name out, like Bernstein being like Jewish music. Why can't it just be music? I mean, like I'm, it's not like I, I'm like I go to temple all day. I yeah. never go to temple. I yeah. just like I'm just a guy that's Jewish, you know. But I, every once in a while, I think of an idea and I call up John. He goes, "Hey John, I got this idea." And he goes, "I don't like it." <laughs> Bam. Okay. And then finally, I said, "Ah, oh, screw it, man." And then. Right when I was really starting to get into New Orleans music, and yeah. I had been like doing all this research and checking out the brass bands and checking out the whole thing about how Eddie Bo, he was the nephew of Peter Bocage, and Peter Bocage was one of those guys who played cornet and violin and went all the way back to the original New Orleans bands and all this stuff, and about how the guys who made Little Richard's records in the daytime, they'd be doing, you know, uh, trad gigs in the evening time and realizing yeah oh yeah man i see like rock and roll new orleans jazz like it's exactly the same yes. music played by the same people at different hours with different arrangements and so i'm at a wedding and uh i hadn't played a wedding for a while and it was a jewish wedding so i said uh i better shed the tunes backstage so i started to, to shed um so Except I've been listening to all this New Orleans music, mm-hmm. so I just take out my horn and go, and I went, oh shit, man. Jewish music is New Orleans music. It's all the same thing. And that's when this thing clicked, and I called Zorn up. I was like, yo, yo, I got this idea, man. And he said, go, do it. And that's, that's how it all started. Do you know the story about Louis Armstrong being taken in by this family, oh, yeah. the Karnofsky family? Yeah. Listen, Louis Armstrong and Sly Stone wore Jewish Stars of David's. Louis Armstrong and Sly Stone. Let's think about that. 
like the two great architects of black music were stars. I don't know what that means, yeah. but I've been thinking about it. Yeah. Well, you know, you said earlier, I just had this great conversation last night. Over the years, part of the reason I, when I, we started talking, I said, I feel like I got to talk to you is because I, I walk into so many rooms and people say, you know, I had this conversation with Steve Bernstein about this or that or the other thing that over time, you talk to a lot of folks I and a lot, a lot of, of pe people. A lot of people. <laughs> so I had a conversation last year with Richard Julian. You and he had just come off of this deep talk about how his cl how clubs should be run and the way money should be interacting with audiences. Right. At the time, he was saying, you know, they passed the hat at his club, and you had a kind of a strong opinion about how music needs to be. I don't want to misrepresent it. I, I want to ask you about it. Music needs to be valued, and audiences need to see that there's there's value for what they're paying for. Right. And here's the thing: we're now in this culture where everyone gets their music for free off of the internet. No one buys music. I mean, I, even if they have like their Spotify or Amazon like subscription, like they're not paying for music. I'm sorry, that's not paying for music. They are paying for their coffee. They will go to, to the coffee shop and spend eight bucks for a cup of coffee. True. They will go to the bar and spend twenty dollars for a cocktail. Right? They don't say, "Oh, I got a, uh, I have a cocktail." I, I, I subscription. Send, I, <laughs> I, I give the cocktail people eight dollars a month. So can I just have like seven cocktails? No, it doesn't work like that. So I figured at this point in my life, like I'll never be a rich person, right? It's just not going to happen. I'm not a, but I'm not a poor person. Like $100 doesn't change my life. Do you know what I'm saying? I'm not like living on the edge. And a yes. lot of musicians are. I mean, that's just the nature of it. So they, a lot of guys can't really say no to $100. Me, man, I'll stick at home and like cook up some brown rice and vegetables and play long tones and like have a, a beer from the fridge. I don't need to leave my house. I got a pretty mellow life, you know? I, so I, I figure like if you're not part of the solution, you're part of the problem. So if I don't tell people, if people think, oh, I can go see Stephen Bernstein, all I got to do is like, it, it, it's not like worth a cup of, I'm like not worth a cup of coffee. In fact, I can't remember which, it may have been Jenny Scheinman who said it. I want to meet the person who convinced people that coffee was $8 and music is free. Like somehow Dig they it. convinced people that's it. Yeah. Man, when I was a kid, coffee was 75 cents, yeah. man. Coffee was not eight dollars yeah. and music you paid for yeah that's how it worked and it's just been like how the hell did coffee replace music? but the, I, that's a really interesting point i also feel that we are missing in life places where music is happening in our lives yes and it's not a i and thou us and them separation it's happening in life and if in order to achieve that it means we're passing a hat instead of a guy standing at the door keeping people out you know, is there some value to that? Yes, but what if that makes it so musicians will never make a living and then we all die of starvation? Is that a good thing? Obviously not. Right. Because then we, you can't, I always tell people, when people used to ask me, like, why do you play weddings and this yeah. and that? And I said, because if I can't eat and I can't live, then I can't play music. Yeah. I have to eat. You know, like I always worked my whole life so I could play music. Like, what's the point? Like, if I'm, if I'm not alive, then I can't play music. I have to eat to stay alive. I have to pay, you know. But I do get the sense that you, you know where your limits are because it, it seems like all of the work that you do that I can tell. I mean, I haven't heard you play a wedding gig, but I'm sure you sound like yourself on a wedding gig. Well, I try my best to sound. <laughs> well, here's the interesting thing about wedding gigs. Uh, when people like some, there was like one guy, yeah. a real beautiful musician, but very much into like free improvisation and yeah. avant-garde. And he said to me, when I was starting to work a lot, he said, man, yeah. you know, get me on some gigs. I said, oh, yeah, definitely. I said, you have a tuxedo? I said, what do you mean? I said, I, I, I got to get you on some weddings on Saturday. He goes, well, I don't want to do weddings. And I said, look, you like free improvisation, right? Yeah. I said, yeah. And I said, what's free improvisation? You hear a sound in your head, and then that's what you do. Yeah. Well, that's what a wedding is. You, you hear that, that's, they start that song, that's the sound that's in your head. Yeah. So you just, just play it. And it's actually such a great thing for your ears to be like, Oh man, they're starting that Frank Sinatra song. All right, now I got to like access what that is, or they're playing that Commodore song or that Jewish song or whatever. Yeah. And it forced, it's like the ultimate free improvisation. Like you play what you hear because that's what you hear. <laughs> right. There's a little uh, logical twist in that that I like. You're, what you're hearing is the appropriate thing for the gig. Exactly. And that's what it's all about. But on the other hand, most of the projects that I'm aware of that you do all have your sort of stamp on them. 
Yeah, but you think about, like, I was just on the road with Little Feet all, all, yeah. all year. And, I mean, me and Jay Collins wrote yeah. the arrangements. Yeah, I get to play them in my style, but still those original ones were the Tower of Power ones. I have to play somewhat like that. It's like I'm not putting, I'm not making the arrangement sound like Duke Ellington. I'm right. playing it. And same with Levon. When I was playing with Levon, I mean, I'm, I'm just, you the thing about the first band record that had the horn section yeah. that was Snooky Young. Yeah. So you have to say like the band is connected to Jimmy Lunsford. I regret to say I never made it up there to see those yeah. gigs. Was the section kind of loose? We improvised the first three years. Yeah. The first three years were just me and Eric Lawrence. And what happened was we got to the first gig and they said, Yeah, Levon probably won't come down to rehearse, but here's some songs he might want to do. Yeah. I listened to the songs I said, well, there's no way we're going to be able to. So I just told Eric, I said, look, here's what do. Don't, like, one of the bad things about weddings is when people try to, like, play the same part and they don't, and it's like, sounds bad. I said, look, and I don't want to be in that situation. I said, look, don't try to play what I'm playing. I'll play the trumpet part. You just play the saxophone part. So I would play what I thought the trumpet part was, and Eric would play what he thought the saxophone part was. So it sounded like. Oh, so it's not like two little hooked up things. No. It's like it's like different things. We're, we're both hearing. We're both playing what we hear, and we free improvised basically the first three years. So did it, it, it almost sounds like it's got a little Dixieland element to it. Then, well, that that's sense. how New Orleans music worked yeah. too. The idea is you have your role, and there's a certain yeah. parameters you use, and you use certain notes and there's certain rhythms. Yeah. So it's not like you're just playing Anything. whatever. You're yeah. playing what you hear in that music. And then eventually what happened, it became a three-piece section, then it became a four, then a five, and then Levon lost his voice. So then we had to make the horns kind of more of a show so the people wouldn't notice that Levon wasn't singing. Right. <laughs> so we kind of made the horns like really kind of spectacular sounding and like wrote these really kind of big arrangements. And Levon could still sing one or two songs a, 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 a night if his voice was okay. But I mean, there was a period where he could just... Man, before we lost his voice, it was insane. He was I know that, that you loved that gig. What, what was it about connecting with that music that hit you that, like that? It was the most spiritual, pure music, man. Yeah. You ask anyone who was in that room, and it was... Bob Belden came once. I'll tell you what it was. Bob, you know who Bob yeah, was? Sure. Is and, and was one. Yeah. <laughs> so he, he said to me afterwards, he goes, this is the most amazing thing. Everything Levon plays, he invented. Yeah. And so because you have this guy who's like this dynamic leader, it was like playing with Duke or Count Basie or Art Blakey. You're playing with someone who had invented, they are a master of something that they kind of invented. Yes. And the feeling it gave you to play with his, like, we would do these kind of like New Orleans style endings, but he never talked about it. And even the very first time I played with him, He's the kind of guy, the, I, hadn't, I hadn't even met him when I first played with him. We were on stage already from playing some earlier music with a different rhythm section, and he just walked onto stage, like, smiled at us and started playing. Count off a tune, give us a key. I'd never played with him before. And you get to the end of a tune, you go, rap, 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 kum, 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 and you realize, oh, right, he's telling me that's a big cue, something's supposed to happen, so you, you just play something. And, and guess what? He put it out on a, on a record. And I had the, of, of us playing together, For the of first a song time. I didn't know, yeah. and I had never even met him. But that's the purest form of music. Yeah. And when you played with him, it was this pure communication. And it was that thing where you're playing with a fucking, excuse my language, he was playing with like a master. Like this guy, the sound he could get out of his instrument. And when he did sing, man, it was incredible. So it really, and it changed my life. You know what? I'll tell you what. It taught me that there's no shame in playing the melody. And well, like you said, there's no shame in playing a chord with a one a root and a fifth in it. Right. But, but before I got there, yeah. I had to get to the point where, because we were always, in the world I lived in, we were exploding melodies. Yeah. That was what we were. You know, another thing I used to talk about, and again, it's been, I'm remembering all the stuff from being in this neighborhood, yeah. was like how much the, what they then called the downtown scene actually came from... Ken Kesey and Andy Warhol as much as it came from Ornette and Cecil. I think, I think Kesey and Warhol were just as important for the music we were playing as Ornette and the art ensemble. To, to what extent? Because it was about expanding consciousness. It was about taking reality and, it, you know, I, I did this thing where I wrote the liner notes for um, the re-release of 
the New York Art Quartet, which was another band that really influenced me. And then Roswell became a super close friend of mine. Yeah. And in fact, I did a session for Roswell while he was in hospice. Like he's in a bed, like, you know, a week or a few days away from death. And he's like, oh, I got this tune. I wrote this one part, but I can't play it. You know, I know you're in hospice. You can't. You think you could like do so they went next door, like in the next room, they had a little tape recorder set up. And I did a session for him while he was lying. It was an amazing it. experience. Anyway, and I was listening to the New York Art Quartet. I said, you know what makes this music what it is, really, is that what Milford was doing on the drums it wasn't like Sonny Murray where he was like playing like an open kind of universe thing. And obviously it wasn't like Art Taylor or Art Blakey. But it was like all these 6-8 rhythms and 4-4 four, four rhythms, but like almost like a Picasso. Or like you'd see like the ears over here. Like hmm. uh, it's, it wasn't like Cubist. All, Cubist, Cubist rhythm. And, and I don't know if Peter's there, but Peter said, yeah, and he, he used a great word for it, how it, it kind of like shattered the the idea the the picture the mirror kind of you know and I think that's what Warhol and Kesey and those guys did and then you, you can still you still there are mirrors you can look at that aren't shattered but you also can't unshatter the mirror mm. and so my generation grew up with that shattered mirror so yeah. like well now we're like well how do we how do we express that in music now like I I, I listen to Duke Ellington every day for thirty five years. Yes. But I can't unhear the White Album. Do you know what I'm saying? Yes. I can't unhear Jimi Hendrix. I can't unhear... So it's like listening to the White Album is almost like having a psychedelic experience that just changes the chemistry of your brain. changes everything. Once you've heard music that sounds like that, yeah. it's like, well, yeah, that's possible too. Yeah, you can sit in a room with guys and write something great and have them play great, and that's one thing. And then, and then, and then once you hear Sly, and once you start hearing, like, you know, fresh... I mean... Fresh had such a huge impact on, it took 10 years, but Fresh and On the Corner yeah. had a huge impact on my world. Well, so I think, and this is a good way to get your Berkeley brothers up here, that there's something that came out of the Bay, yes. that there was a set of values that both loved groove and funk music and the avant-garde thing. And I, yes. I actually didn't put it together until really thinking about having this conversation with the three of you guys today. Will and, and Peter, are you guys here? Yeah. Come on up. Let's do this. All right. We'll do a little overlap. Oh, perfect timing. On point. Yo, I've known these guys since... I've known Peter since I was 11. I've known Will. I met him in, in seventh or eighth grade. At the, he's older. Will, I'm one point. Is what, Will Bernard one year what, older? No, he's way older. Will's <laughs> way older than me. And Peter, Peter Applebaum. Cheers. He was. He must have been. He was like doing some kind of illegal. Because <laughs> I moved here first, I got beat up earlier. Yeah, yeah. But I, I met him in seventh grade at the at the at the at the play not the playground. What do you call it? The the schoolyard. The schoolyard. Yeah. yeah. But he was already in ninth grade. But Pete, I've known since I was eleven years old. Well, I love that we get to do at least a quick over overlap here. Will Bernard and Peter Applebaum, you guys have been, as we just alluded to, have been hanging out with each other for, like, a long time. Yeah, we've known each other pretty, pretty much uh, over 50 years, and we've been playing music almost that long. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You play in each other's projects. You've started projects together. You're here ostensibly because you're doing this Revelator gig right. tonight, for the, which is, is it basically, is it your project, Peter, Revelator? Or is it well, a, it started as my idea, but the nice thing about it is it, it's truly collective, we did it a few times, and then Will had a residency at the Stone. I had one the year before, and that's the first time we played. And then Will got us to do it as part of his residency. Um, then Bill came up with the name for the group, Revelator. And Aaron, who's normally the drummer, Aaron Johnston, um, was the one who's so far heretofore been the most on top of it in terms of recording and videoing the group and then um sometimes he'll announce the group too which is perfect because then it's really an equal opportunity thing and the performances are completely improvised so nobody whatever ideas anybody has on the way to the gig nobody else knows until we hit the stage do you talk about the music before you play it at all no never is that a thing that can happen in part because you guys just know each other so well it's partly that, but I think I would say it's more something else. Improvising to most people means making it up as you go. And it is, that is what it is. But when you become a musician who does that, 
regularly, that becomes something that you kind of have a way of doing. So it's not as random or hit or miss as you might think. So we get up there and we, we have these, you know, we've all played in projects over many, many years where there's the concept of opposition, which means you're playing something but doesn't necessarily have to be in the same time signature or even in the same key as somebody else. Is that um, a concept that was developed? I mean, in some, some instances, it just kind of happens naturally. And in others, um, it is something that we, we talked about. When I play with musicians I've never played before, sometimes I'll say, hey, don't feel like you have to follow me. You know, do your own thing and let's find something together, but we can be in opposing time signatures or, you know, it can be multidimensional. So we talked about that a little bit, but, but, but it's more, I think, that we have come to see um, not just the jazz avant-garde, but dub music, beat music, whatever you want to call it, as having potential for creative development. So we make it up as we go, but we all have these backgrounds of having... We've had a lifetime of doing that, so we, we know that we're making up forms and even like songs as we go. There's something that was coming out of Berkeley, it seems to me, where you guys liked groove music and rock music and funk music and also the avant-garde, and they both sort of evolved at the same time and with the same amount of kind of love and, and attention. One thing I was thinking on the way over it was just that particular time period we all came up in the late 60s early 70s was a really fertile time for yeah. for music and especially in the bay area i think too and we were all kind of grew up in the middle of it you know whether we were you know we were maybe a little young to go out to a lot of the clubs but um it was around in the air it was in the air yeah i, I would concur for sure and i would also say that for me personally i think one thing that was was great about that time was it was you know i've always been interested in really wide instrumentation and since i was really little like two three years old i, I was playing you know originally like in nursery school in this corner where there was a piano and little bongos and a xylophone and a ukulele, and I just loved just making stuff up like kids do, using a wide variety of sounds. And I've kind of always done that. You know, I started on drums, then went to piano, and then went to saxophone. And, and I just love using a wide range of sound. And in the Bay Area, in the 70s, if you went to a jazz club, you would see a wide variety of instrumentation. Um, more than like 10 years before, for example. If you looked at the drummer's corner, he might have conga drums, yeah. you know, tablas, gongs, even hubcaps. And that really appealed to me. And I think we were all influenced by that. Part of it is musical taste because you have people like Benny Green, who we went to school with, yep. who's a fantastic, unbelievable jazz pianist. But he's chosen to specialize in that certain thing as part of the tradition. But uh, me and Will, I think, represent being influenced by this wide variety of, of multicultural styles and approaches and instrumentation yes. that was going on then. The, the first time I heard Peter, he played a concert in, uh, on the playground in kindergarten on drums. Is this true? <laughs> you, <laughs> that is Did true. you guys go to kindergarten together? He was, I was first grade, he was kindergarten, yeah. yeah. Like for people that grew up with you, this is like seeing you sitting next to each other right now. This is not a new thing. <laughs> This is like an expected thing. It's probably pretty old. At this yeah. <laughs> but, you know, you described that thing about being in the corner around the toy piano and the ukulele and whatever, and that sort of freedom to just make it up. And yeah. it seems very much in line with what you're describing with Revelator, which is like to just show up and make it up. Well, that's exactly right. And I think that's one of the things that, to me, there's kind of two great things about doing what we do in this, especially in this improvised context. One is that you maintain this kind of child creativity. You know, we're basically like kids on stage playing in the sandbox together, making sound castles. And um, then there's this thing of life every day is different, and we're so lucky to be in an art form that embraces that. Just like that, you know, who could have punctuated that any better? Matt Marowitz. <laughs> One of the things I was thinking on the way over here was... Um, Oh, Peter and I have been playing for years and years, and most of the time it's been in these pretty structured uh, situations. And uh, this is kind of different for us, I think, for me yeah. and Peter to have a group like this where we improvise most of the time. And, yeah, we uh, did this as teenagers. Sorry, Will. Yeah. No, yeah. Will is right. Um, 
you know, I compose and Will composes, and that's another thing that we both enjoy a lot. But this is kind of going back to something that we did informally sometimes, just jamming. Yeah. Composition is, in a way, a kind of frozen improvisation. It's kind of like uh, a worked over edited improvisation. But I mean, composition always has to start with a kind of improvisatory element, impulse, right? Yeah. So in a sense, I, sometimes I think calling it free improvisation, you, you might as well call it free composition. That yeah. People have called it that, yeah. In, instant, instantaneous composition. Instantaneous composition. Absolutely, because yeah. that is something, you know, we're, it's spontaneous architecture. Yes. We are creating these forms. Yes. And without really having much of, a, of, of, a, of a, an idea of, of doing it, but as Ahmad Jamal, the great pianist, said, you have to, if you're an architect, you have to have, you can, you can improvise, but you have to have some idea of what's going to work in order for the roof not to. Get That's right. Things like that. But we do arrive at these, these forms and it is, yeah, you know, it's interesting because a group I had with Steven Bernstein in the mid seventies, when we were <laughs> both about 14, 15, 16, would improvise every weekend at my dad's house. And Steven and somebody else, a couple of the other guys in the band, discovered something in my dad's freezer that they liked. Um, I didn't imbibe in that. But anyway, <laughs> we um, get together and play, and then we'd record it on cassette, and we'd listen back to His it. His dad was different than my dad. Yeah, <laughs> your dad didn't have a dad freezer. <laughs> we would tape record these improvisations we would do, and then sometimes the, the cool thing about that was we'd hear something and we'd say, ah, oh, that let's use that. Yeah. Let's actually retain that and make that into something. Exactly. It's not a, as if we're just improvising with no, with not, no background either because we've been playing so long. Like if Peter goes into some sort of thing, I'll, I'll kind of know what he's thinking. Right. I've been hearing it for decades and decades and right, well, the so way around. And, that's the thing. Like on the one hand, you, you just sort of know, right? I mean, if somebody starts telling the joke, you know the you sort of know the punchline or, or, or whatever, starts cook, making the meal, you sort of know the recipe. Mm -hmm. But it's totally free at the same time. Are you, are you having, because you've worked with each other for so long, are you looking to surprise one another at this Hopefully. stage? <laughs> Hopefully. Yeah, I would say, you know, what do you think, Will? I would say for myself, I'm not really thinking about that, but I'm kind of trying to surprise myself. I know, I that's what that. I was going to say, too, is just, I always w try to play music that I would be surprised or <laughs> be uh, interested in. Yeah. If it's interesting to me, then it's something new that I haven't maybe done a million times, or, right. you know, or some new combination. Like if Peter's playing something, you know, I might come in with something that we'd never a combination that we hadn't done tried before. before. And we react, you know, things come out of all the stuff we've heard in our lives. Like I might play something that I think, why does that sound so familiar? I just have to play it. And I play it. And it turns out it's from like Ravel's Bolero. Right. <laughs> maybe Laswell will hear that. And he maybe he hates it. So he just turns up <laughs> and tries to like override me or something. Right. That's, that's where you, that's where you like can that. get into the opposition theory. I'm just Opposition as a form of protest, as opposed to opposition as a form of expression, or, or both at the same time. Right. You may disagree. I mean, I suppose that happens, right? That yeah. there can be disagreement, which is maybe not a bad thing because disagreement happens in conversation anyway. That's absolutely right. You know, that's actually kind of a fascinating thing. Um, Herbie Hancock once said that he described his playing with Miles Davis in the 60s yeah as um, they, they would get into these improvisational sequences. And it was like having a conversation where you'd have an idea, and but before you could make your comment or idea, sometimes the conversation would shift. Yeah, right. <laughs> and he'd say, well, I was going to play something, and then I realized two seconds later it was no longer relevant. Yes. <laughs> so that happens. And I That's think true. that yeah. in terms of when you play and you improvise and somebody does something that you're not loving or you don't think fits. Um, it presents an interesting challenge and rather than like stalking off stage or, or something, and I don't think any of us necessarily would turn up or try to drown each other yeah. out um, unless it was as a joke or something. But I think what you do is you adapt and that's a really civilized, interesting thing. You, you adapt by either, like Herbie Hancock said, you either withhold your idea and you're like, okay, that's actually not going to work now. Yeah. Or you find some other way to do it that you do like, that you do think it's successful. And 
you know, part of the time that means, a large part of the time that means you just stop. And that's a beautiful yeah. thing about four people playing together. You can all stop and just let one person have it for a while. Yeah, I think that's one thing that experienced improvisers are, do is like let a lot of room, you know, leave a lot of room and listen a lot. Listen and, and respond. You know, the other three people on the stage may not necessarily care what you had in mind because that's not what's happening right now, you know? Right. There's also a lot of uh, compositional things you can do, like thinking about background and foreground. Yeah. And, you know, you just think of all the... If, you, if, if you're a composer or a producer, you know, you have this bag of tricks to, to draw on, I think, that, that helps. You talk about being on the New York scene. You know, I, uh, at different stages in your lives and careers, you both ended up in New York, mm -hmm. and Steve did too, what do you think the, the musical, artistic conversation has been between Berkeley and New York for you guys? For me, I, you know, I was drawn to New York music. I think we all were for, since an early age and reacted to the aesthetic in a way that was very different from the Bay Area aesthetic. Yeah, yeah, I, that's an interesting question um, because it isn't just bringing where you came from. Right. But it's also like what attracted you I mean, part of the reason I came to New York was people like Steven and Daphne Prieto and people that I already had musical relationships with that I wanted to continue and kind of start a new chapter and be a little closer to Europe and mm -hmm. places where I would be working more. But aesthetically, like Will is saying, I think one reason that, that a lot of us were, at least speaking for myself, attracted to some of the avant-garde um, in the early 70s when we were young teenagers, like the Art Ensemble, Cecil Taylor, Sun Ra, Pharaoh Sanders, Sonny Murray, Albert Eiler, they represented something that was really, really cutting edge and, I mean, a lot of things at once. For me, it was partly the wide variety of instrumentation, yeah. wide variety of approaches, but also something really about the intensity of it that I, I loved, that I heard, you know, you hear that in Charlie Parker and you hear that in, in Ellington, in any band that's like really on fire, whether it's Stravinsky or whatever. Do but. you think that the struggle is part of the intensity? Um, not necessarily. It definitely can be, but the only reason I kind of take issue to that is that I think that that definitely can be part of it, but it, um, because everybody brings their emotions to the music. Yeah. And a lot of us are struggling. You know, it's not an easy life for sure. But I, I think that the only issue I have with people hearing that is that it has a danger of reducing it um, to something that's more superficial. Mm -hmm. And it's a lot more than that. For me, like, you know, sometimes people would say that the art ensemble sounded angry, or they even said I sounded angry. But to me, I just love the intensity of it. I mean, it, it's hard. I mean, so it's, it's, I think that for me, it was, there's something like when you break apart something and all this stuff comes out, like the intensity of throwing the, like a garbage can full of percussion instruments down the stairs. It's something that's very, you know, what should I say, kind of intense and very, like, it, it, it knocks you out with how unconventional it is. It's like raining percussion. Yeah. And um, I love that in music, you know, not all the time, but I think that, that, I think that that's something that's just um, something you're drawn to if you want excitement in music. So I, I think of it that way. I, I mean, I think that there is a lot, of, like what you said, the struggle is something real and that, just the climate here, like it's mm -hmm. really hot and really cold. So what do you do? You stay in and you practice, you know, like, like in Cal California, it's like a beautiful day. It's like, let's go to the beach or something. Totally. It's like, <laughs> or let's go outside. And, no, I do wonder and, uh, if, if your the f physical environment to some degree, like seeps in and, and influences the kind of music you make it and the way you make it. And, but, but I also feel like that's a, a, a plus in the California music scene and, and I think we're all real proud of, of coming from that. And the, there's a certain kind of um, relaxation, I think, in the music. One thing that I feel about, about the Bay Area in general is that it does seem to be its own ecosystem and its own microcosm. And it's actually quite enclosed in a lot of ways. I mean, I, I realize over time that so many musicians and artists that I admire in New York actually have 
some Bay Area roots and that there's been this, as I call it, a conversation oh, that's been going on for a long time. Yeah. But at the same time, every time I go there, I realize that there are all these people who loom super large in the Bay that maybe are kind of unsung or less known. And there's a whole kind of language that gets developed there. And it yeah. has the opportunity to kind of incubate in its own privacy. I've always said that, you know, a professional musician in the Bay Area um, over the course of maybe 10 years or so is probably going to end up doing like an Israeli folk gig. Totally. Yeah. A polka gig, a reggae gig, a Latin gig, jazz gig. And they get all this experience. Yes. It's a smaller crew and they... You know, they do, like you're saying, a lot of different types of music. I believe so deeply in that. I really think that that's, in a funny way, the hardest thing about New York is yeah. that you're kind of asked to pick a lane. Even if your lane is exploding a couple of genres or, or trying to combine them in some way or, yeah. or, or staying inside and outside at the same time, that in its own way is kind of choosing a lane. But when yeah. you grow, grow come up in a smaller scene you know, the reality is you just kind of are going to play all these different kinds of music. Yeah, I, th I think that's a, yeah, it's a difficulty for people like us to, yes. to fit into that situation sometimes because so when you, you go stand in line for any of the lanes, you know, that's the thing, climb up these little ladders and meet the right people and do also, whatever you need to do that's to get right. on that, on that particular scene. You know? Yeah. And here with the scenes being more defined, like for, for instance, um, there's, there's a great gospel scene in New York. Yeah. Like in most, in pretty much every city in the U.S. that has a strong African-American component. You have the church. In the Bay Area, that scene mixes with jazz, mm -hmm. with R&B, which is natural, but even like with avant-garde, huh. with, you know, Latin music yep. and stuff like that. Oakland Interfaith Gospel yeah. Choir for instance. Here, there's these strong traditions, and people do mix, so it's not quite as simplified as we're saying. There's a, amazing mixing and combinations, but it's, it's, it's a little more separated. Getting back to uh, our project, one of the people who, who has developed a career doing this is Bill Lazarus. Yes. You know, he's this colliding uh, styles and musicians. Is right. Something we admire with him, which probably has something to do with the fact of our upbringing, you know, in, in that environment. And that's why he probably likes us to, you know, like it's kind of like when Don Cherry moved there to, to play with Peter's groups, the Hieroglyphics. Don Cherry moved there to play with the Hieroglyphics that's what Ensemble? He said, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He played with us in, well, we met in the 70s, but we, he played with us as a guest with my band, the Hieroglyphics, in 1988. And then he moved there the next year and started this band, Multi Culti, with yep. a few of us from Hieroglyphics and yep. continued to perform as a guest with Hieroglyphics and lived there till the end of his life in the mid 90s. Yeah. People that really showed us the way, like Don Cherry, um, were people that were pioneers in bringing Indian music into jazz, bringing yep. African, Japanese, Brazilian musicians into their thing. But keeping that, I guess you could say, jazz aesthetic. Like people that, that are tuned into Relics will know Trey Anastasio's music. When I worked with Trey from 2002 to 2007 or so, he was often working with a very jazz aesthetic. He wasn't playing jazz stylistically, although one or two tunes he actually would. But, um, but he was doing this very spontaneous thing. And Don Cherry had a way of incorporating musicians and, and enriching his whole vocabulary doing that. Bill Laswell does it too in a slightly different way, like I'm glad Will brought that up about the colliding thing, because Bill has this concept he calls sound collision, and that's when you have these, it's really whatever your interpretation of that is, but basically sounds come together that wouldn't ordinarily go together. And sometimes it's not necessarily smooth, it can be jarring. And that's kind of part of it. You know? I mean, do you, do you think in that sense that there are some sounds that naturally want to be together? Some tonalities, some rhythms, some things that universally want to hook up and others that don't? Yes, absolutely. And I think, I mean, I think a big example of that is if somebody starts clapping or dancing or playing a drum beat, other people that want to join in will be in that same orbit. So yeah, to speak. yeah. They'll, they'll, they'll hook up with that and that'll be the pulse. But if you're dealing from like a harmonic concept, which was Ornette Coleman's concept, yeah. it basically is a wider concept that incorporates people doing different things 
as part of it could be the same village, but they're working on different uh, tasks or whatever. I mean, to me, it's a huge challenge not to hook up with a pulse or a rhythm in a room. I mean, as a matter of fact, like my, my dad's whole trip is that humans are the only animals who are, can collect, other than birds that can fly in, in formations, that can collectively entrain, meaning we can all clap on two and four, and that we, we actually start to vibrate in the same way when rhythm is present. And our brains actually are vibrating rhythmic. You know, brain waves are ryth- rhythmic also. Yeah. So the idea that when you hear a pulse or a rhythm and you don't hook up with that, mm-hmm. That's a, that's a major challenge to your body to do that. The thing is, there's all kinds of different rhythms going on. That's all. true. There's a heartbeat rhythm, and yes. that's the one most people are drawn to. And yes. then there's all these other kinds of uh, cross rhythms that you can tune into. That's right. And then you can you know, quantify them, which a lot of people are doing these days. Yeah. I mean, there's arrhythmic rhythms, and then there's more you know, polyrhythmic loops and then so there's you know a lot of these kind of things you can play off of when you're playing together you can do kind of loops in a different completely different time or different uh tempo or time signature that that happen at the same time yep or may overlap in some way or may connect and that's not necessarily arrhythmic you know it's like there's it's just a more complicated rhythm you know that's a nice way to put it will you should write that down (laughs) There's all these different purposes music can have, even within a set. Yeah. Just like you're saying, Leo, like if there's a strong rhythm coming from the bass and drums, a lot of times I want to join in with that. Yeah. And do my part and be part of this big wheel yeah. rhythm. But other times when you have something that drifts off into something where there's more opposition going on, that creates its own kind of tension. Totally. Mm-hmm. And so sometimes that's what you want. It's like having a salad with the meal. Yeah. You don't want only salad. But you want something that, like, after 10 minutes of groove, you might want something more atmospheric. Yeah. Then you might be ready for something more tuneful. Then you might want something that, like, just comes in and shatters all of that. I think that's one thing that's true of our aesthetic is that we, we're not afraid to go into a groove, but we're also not afraid to do something completely abstract. And there's, you know, there's a lot of musicians who, who would think that playing a groove is corny or something, you know. It's not, it's right, like, and then there's a whole other group of people that are totally afraid to leave the groove, you know, yeah, that yeah. that's like leaving home. Right. Um, Will Bernard and Peter Applebaum, I don't know uh, if our friends behind the curtain are going to uh, shut us down, but that's it for us from the Bowers and Wilkins Sound Lounge. There they were, the Berkeley boys, Stephen, Will, and Peter. A thoughtful group of folks. I really enjoyed spending time at Winter Jazz Fest and doing these interviews. Stay tuned for another batch of them coming soon. I'll be back in your ears ASAP. Until then, I'll talk to you soon.